Good morning, traders, and welcome to the Bookmap Pro Trader webinar today with Gary Norden. Gary is going to go over analyzing your trading statistics within Bookmap. Uh, he's done a webinar series with us previously called Mastering the Dome. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can find that on our YouTube channel under the playlist of Mastering the Dome. Let's give a little bit of background uh, on Gary and his trader biography. Uh, he is the founder of the Norden Method. Uh, Gary has been a professional trader for over 30 years, including several years in the trading pits of the Life Exchange, as well as a senior trader at some of the world's largest investment banks. He is a co-owner of NN Squared Capital and creator of the Norden Method, a unique style of trading order flow. Gary is the author of An End to the Bull and Technical Analysis Exposed, why most technical analysis traders lose. If you want to reach out to Gary, we have his contact information here. Uh, he has two different websites, uh, the NordenMethod.com as well as GaryNorden.com. I'll be pasting these into the chat if you're interested, so you can click directly on the links. Let's go over the disclosures and then we'll turn it over to Gary. General disclosure, all bookmap limited materials, information, and presentations are for educational purposes only and should not be considered specific investment advice nor recommendations. Risk disclosure, trading futures, equities, and digital currencies involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Gary, please take it away. Okay, so this webinar is about using trading stats to Im improve your trading. Um, so I'm going to come up and talk about a, a number of key points. Um, and I guess you know, in a way, conjunction with the fact that Bookmapper have you know re reasonably recently um, launched their uh, trade analysis tool. So if we just move on to the next slide, uh, the usual disclaimers. Keep that for a couple of seconds, and then we can move. All right, so the question is, do you analyze your, your stats? And I must say, to me, as a professional trader with my, with my background, this, would, this question wouldn't normally be asked. Um, but it's apparent to me that um, there's a lot of retail traders that, that actually don't analyze their stats. Um, and even the, some that do don't analyze them in, in near enough, uh, the, enough detail. Um, some platforms, some traders only want some basic details, some basic features, some, some don't look at it at all. Um, and Bruce and I were talking off air beforehand about you know, some tools that have been developed and that sort of no one wants to use them, in, which is, I find baffling. Um, if you do analyze your stats, how often do you do it and how do you do it? Um, and so this webinar is going to talk about how, how I would do it, how, how we do it with the Norton method. And just to put forward some ideas that will help you to analyze your trading stats and to explain to you how and why you should be doing it. But certainly I think that in the retail industry, there's a lot of traders that don't do it and probably don't know how to do it. So Bookmap Trade Analyzer tool, has it got a flash name, uh, Bruce, or do you just call it a trade analyzer? I think it's just called Trade Analyzer right now. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, so it's a relatively new feature for, for Bookmap users. Um, it has a range of different information, and I'll, you know, I'll get to in a second about which ones you can use. Um, but certainly if you're not using it when you're trading, um, you really should, and that's what I want to talk to you about, how this is such an important tool to help your trading. So some, some key points about analyzing data. The first thing you have to know is you, have, you need to know what you're looking for. And I think the when a lot of traders, uh, retail traders, those that want to look at stats, they'll look at things like, you know, their profit and losses, and we'll talk about resulting soon in this, in this webinar. But actually, to understand what you're looking for when you're analyzing your trade stats requires, you know, quite a deep understanding of the method you are trading. And this is quite important. Different trading styles are going to show sometimes different types of stats. And some different stats might be more important and, and, and doing certain well in certain areas might be more important for some styles than others. So you'll need to know what metrics should you be scoring high in. And this is something when you're learning to trade, whoever you learn from, these are questions that you need to ask. You need to understand, how do I know whether I'm performing well? And it's, as we'll talk in a second, it's not just your P&L on any given day or any given trade is not 
always a great indicator that something was a good trade or a good example of the style that you're doing. So, for example, the Norda method, my students send me videos which you know I narrate and I put up for others to see. You know, and sometimes um, there'll be trades which are profitable, um, but there's certain metrics about them that mean they are not proper Norda method trades. They may be profitable, but they're not what I want to see. Um, and I'll go through why and, and, what, and how that will be shown. So you need to understand with whatever style of trading you're doing, what metrics should you be scoring highly in? Again, these, these, this deep understanding of, of the method that you're using. What metrics will show you that you are trading well or that you are trading poorly? Do you know that? And by asking that question, for those, you know, even those of you that, that are using stats, one of the things about this is it opens up that question of how deeply do you understand the style that you're using? You know, and there may be many traders that can't answer that question. What metrics will show you that your trading is good or bad on a day outside of PL? As I say, we'll get to PL in a second. But what metrics will show you? And if you don't know, then that's a really interesting question that you need to then go and research and you need to find out for your style. So for me and with my students, you know, I'll tell them exactly what, how they should be looking uh, if they're doing it properly. And, and if they're not doing it properly, as we'll get on, we'll, there'll be certain red flags that will show them that they're not. It's also really impo important after that that you are able to respond to the feedback you're getting. One of the reasons why you know, this trade analytics is so important is you're getting lifetime feedback on your trading. And if you can respond to that lifetime, it's, it's massive. You know, again, a key part of what I try to teach people is, you know, this thing happens to you or this particular metric is showing something. This is how you need to respond to it. This is how you, you respond to it. So, and it's really important that you're able to do that. I think maybe in some of my previous webinars, I've talked about, you know, compared like to golf, you know, you need to know if you're hooking a golf ball, you need to know um, what it means to hook a golf ball, what it looks like, right? And you need to know how to correct it, okay? And same in trading. If you're doing something wrong, you need to know what it is you're doing wrong, how that appears in your stats. And then, of course, the next stage is how to correct it. And the, the next stage after that is to actually go and correct it, you know, which is another point in itself. If you can't, uh, you don't know how to adapt your trading based on the trade data you're getting, the analysis that you're getting, then really, again, you don't know enough about the trading method. And looking at the data alone is not going to help you. Okay, so again, for, for, for many traders, they may go away from this and think, you know what, I don't know my style in enough depth that I could answer that question. Okay, look, for some people, it's like, oh yeah, positive P&L means I'm doing well, negative P&L means I'm doing badly. I'll get onto that in a minute, but it's more, it's, you need to know more than that. And, and there's a range of information that can be important there. So with the data we get as we're trading, um, you know, during any given day, and, and I'm, again, this works for different time frames, but I, I'm focusing more on intraday uh, trading because that, that's what most futures traders are doing. You know, I'm focused more on futures for here. Um, so it requires constant re-evaluation. You should ideally constantly be evaluating your trading stats and re-evaluating your trading. Anybody, you know, any of you that trade during the trading day know that the trading day changes, right? That the open is... Uh, has one level of volatility and, and, and action midway through the day, it changes and, and perhaps towards the end of the day it might change again. So your trading stats are probably going to change during that day. And again, we're not just talking about P&L, we're talking about all the very bits of information that could occur, okay? And there's, a, there, there's for, for us, there, there might be, you know, I don't know, a minimum half a dozen, but up towards a dozen different pieces of information uh, in our trade analysis, our trade data that might tell us something that is important. And during the day, it might change, which one's more important or which one's changing, and you need to be alive to that. So constantly re-evaluating, you know, and this is how we continually improve and make sure that we are changing as the market conditions are changing, rather than just set something up at the beginning of the day and just monitor at the end. There are a lot of people that just look at their trading stats at the end of the day, right? Now that's one type of trade analysis. Okay, and I'm not really covering that too much today, but that is one kind 
of trade analysis. At the end of the day, see how you did, right? That's one thing. But what I'm really pushing for here in this webinar is to, to say to you, can you do it during the day? Because then your, your trading is going to improve along the way. You're going to constantly reevaluate what you're doing. You're going to constantly improve. That's how I teach my students. And so that, you know, we are, we are reevaluating lifetime so that we don't get to the end of the day and go, oh, that, that was bad, or that was bad, or I could have changed that. We're trying to do it intraday. At the end of the day, that's a different style of trade analysis, right? And again, you're gonna anal analyze it at the end of the day, but your end of the day analysis is gonna be easier and your trading stats will be better if you're doing the intraday analysis after every trade. And every time you're getting a new trade, uh, you know, and that next line is filled on your trade analyzer or is updated, you're getting new information, okay? You're getting new feedback about what you're doing. Can you respond to it? And, and it might be small adjustments, but every time you can make a small adjustment, every time you see something, then that's gonna be vital to you. That's gonna, that, that could be important. And that's really what I encourage with my students to constantly be responding to feedback, constantly making these small changes. Um, sometimes there might be a few things you can change. So, you know, with our style, um, we might see a certain stat that's, that's not what we want, and there may be two or three ways of fixing that. And so it might take two or three attempts to make the correct adjustment. Okay, simply go back to the golf. If you're hooking a golf ball, there could be three or four things wrong, right? Could be stance, could be grip, could be, you know, a hand action, it could be, you know, a few things. It might take you two or three uh, shots to, to correct the right one, okay? But you should be able to do that. If you have a good understanding of the trading method you're doing, you should be able to make that adjustment. And then your trading is basically constant adjustments. So coming back to the book, uh, Black Box Thinking um, by Matthew Syed, which, which you know, I, I really like, and I, and I um, you know, tell my students to, to, to read it. Um, so Syed shows you know, uh, many successful entrepreneurs, sports teams, etc., cetera, and, and shows that they apply this method of constant minor adjustments. In fact, one of the uh, examples he uses is uh, Formula One racing team, the Mercedes Formula One racing team. And literally every small little bit of information that's coming back to the engineers during the sessions or during the practice or whatever it is, um, they respond to. And a minor adjustment, they keep saying, they, they are just constantly making minor adjustments. And I think a lot of traders think, you know, that the, the trading will improve is some major eureka moment. It's not likely to be that way. It's likely to be a succession of minor adjustments. And so responding to feedback is a crucial element. It's one thing to get the data. It's another thing to respond to it. If the Mercedes engineers were getting this data and not responding to it, they're not doing their job. So getting the data is one thing, responding to it's another. But this is how, as Syed showed, many of the top people out there, you know, and I think, you know, Dyson, the, the vacuum cleaner man, is another one of his, you know, that he, he talks about because, you know, the Dyson vacuum cleaner wasn't just built overnight. There were just thousands and thousands of small changes and adjustments as things didn't work over a period of time. It's never just going to become what, what you know, what you see now. Um, so responding to feedback is crucial. And you should be looking at this in terms of minor adjustments, small adjustments, and continually making them intraday. And then at the end of the day, like I say, it's a different matter again, but you'll analyze things and, and you'll have some other um, changes to make potentially as well. Personally, um, if I don't know why I've made or lost money or I can't figure out how to improve, um, then I'm not really, you know, that I find that it's a real problem for me, right? And, and I, I may not continue with that particular style of trade. So if I'm doing a new style of trade or something that I think is a bit more interesting or um, I've gone to a different market and I just want to give something a go. If I don't know why something happened and I can't figure it out, I can't figure out the adjustment, I don't like it, right? I'm not going to continue. And, and an example from, from my history is uh, I, a few years ago, tried to, uh, wanted to apply the Norda method to, to crude oil futures. I thought it would be a market that it, it would work quite well in. I've never traded crude oil futures before. I'm you know, generally a financial man. Uh, uh, in equity indices are generally the bread and butter. Um, and, and what I found when I traded crude oil going through my stats is on a P&L basis, I was fine. You know, on a P&L basis, actually, you know, probably outperforming um, some of my days on equity indices. Um, 
in terms of percentage win rates and all that, I again was hitting the similar numbers that I would hit normally. So on the face of it, people, a lot of people would say, uh, well, you're making more money, you're hitting the same percentage win rate, everything's cool. And this was over perhaps a two, three, four week period. Um, but to me, there were some trades in there that, um, that I would lose on and I had absolutely no idea what happened. Absolutely no idea how could I improve it, um, what happened, what, there was nothing at all. Um, to me, when I was trading it, I couldn't figure it out. Um, and that would always, to me, that, that's a, a red flag to me, right? I'm like, well, if that happens now over three or four weeks, what could happen is I might get hit with a number of those one day. So despite the fact over that period, I thought it was fine. There were some red flags in there and some, some certain data that was, um, and certain trades where it just didn't make sense to me. So for me, that's, 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 that's out straight away. That would be out even despite the P&L. As I said, we'll get to P&L in a minute. It doesn't mean I'm aiming for a 100% win rate, right? Of course not. Every trade, every style will have weaknesses. And sometimes after you trigger a trade, unfortunately, the thing that's your weakness for your trade will happen, right? And, and you're going to lose. I mean, we're not, we're not, I'm not saying you're going to aim for 100%. Um, but, but if I lose, I, I will usually know why, you know? Okay, this happened, yeah, okay, that, that's a weakness for this trade, or that, that's, you know, that's, that's always going to hurt me. So therefore, uh, I know I've lost, I know why I've lost. And if it happens a few times, I'll make those adjustments. If it's just a one-off, um, you know, I'll still be looking to be prepared. Um, but the key thing is, can I respond to that data? Can I respond to that feedback? Do I understand my style in enough depth that I can do that? Checklists can be really important and very useful. Um, I think it was in the Daniel Kahneman's book, Noise, he talks about checklists being a really good tool um, to overcome um, poor decision making. So the book Noise is all about how people make bad decisions and it's very applicable to trading, by the way. It's, I'm sure many of you have read it already. Um, but checklists are a really good way of um, being able to, to basically before you, know, before you make decisions, um, you have this checklist of, okay, what needs to happen, what I need to see and how I need to respond. So again, with an order method, we have like certain checklists. So that my traders after a trade can go through it and work out, did this happen, did this happen, did this happen? Um, and it helps in decision making. It's one of the key points, you know, in noise. If you want to make better decisions, have checklists. Um, and they can, you know, tell you what adjustments that you need to make. And it's prepared in advance as well. So you're not on the fly trying to figure this out. You know, and again, if you know your style in enough depth, that you know that these things can happen. What should you be looking for? What changes do you need to, to make? And when to stop? What red flag should you look out for? That's always important as a trader, right? When should you just stop? Um, you know, I, I keep, I think I've said this before on some of my other webinars here, but something I'm always saying to my um, students is, you know, knowing when to stay out is probably the most important thing as a trader. It's gonna pretty much determine your longevity in this business. Do you know when to stay out? And so again, your trading stats can tell you that, not just your PL. You know, your PL is one thing, but your trading stats can tell you there's something odd here or there's something not good that um, perhaps is not right for you and not right for your style, and I need to stay out. So I spoke about results. So for a lot of traders, and I see this so much out there um, with certain trading coaches and people talk about trades in terms of P&L, okay? Uh, trade that's made money is a good trade, trade that loses money is a bad trade. That's just simply not true, okay? You can do stupid things and make money in this business. You can make a very good trade and still lose because something happened. And anybody that plays poker will understand this as well. Uh, you know, that's another uh, uh, pursuit that I like. You know, you can, you know, if let's say you, you could, in a, a no limit hold'em game of poker, you could be a 95% you know, chance of winning a hand. You get all your money and your opponent does. So you've basically got 95% chance of winning based on the cards that are out. You've got a 50, you know, and he's giving you essentially 50-50 on that, right? Well, of course, it's a great trade. But then on the last card, the 5% chance might come up. So you lose everything. Does it mean it was a bad decision to put your money in? No, it was a great decision. You got 50-50 
odds on something that was at you a 95% chance of winning, you know, like it's, it's great he's giving you money. So it was a good trade, it was a good decision, it was just unlucky on the end. And this is, comes as well if you've read Annie Duke's book um, about, you know, decision making. She's written a number of books about that, Thinking in Bets is perhaps the most pop, uh, famous. Um, but she talks about resulting. Resulting is something that is essentially when you judge the uh, whether or not something was good by the result. Okay, so you, you say, oh, I made money on this trade. It was a good trade. And that's just, that, that can lead to poor decision making. Um, and it's one reason why you must know what is required for your method. Right? You must have a baseline out there. This is what it needs to be. Otherwise, how do you know whether the results you're getting are, are good or bad, all right? So you need a baseline out there of what you should be expecting, and therefore, you know, that will help you to get away from resulting. But, you know, I see as well, I spoke, so I said that before that uh, my, my students send me their training videos, I go through them, I narrate them, I post them for everybody else to, to, to learn from, and, you know, there'll be a number of times that, you know, I'll see a trade and it will make money and I'll, and I'll narrate it and say, this, I don't like this trade, it's not a good trade. And then they'll do it again. And, and obviously, because they, perhaps they made money on it, they think that's, that type of trade was a good one. They do it again, they make a little bit as well. Maybe they make two or three ticks, they make two or three ticks. Then they do it again, they lose 10. And as I say, like the, the thing is, it was always a bad trade. It was always a bad trade. Unfortunately, they had a couple of winners doing that, which made them more confident, overconfident that it was a good trade. Okay, now this is generally for my newer students who are still sort of learning the process. Once, you know, for my more experienced traders, they know that, you know, that if they did something and even if it made money, they'll say, oh, that wasn't a good trade, I know it, and they'll, um, and they'll know what stats in there tell them it wasn't a good trade, and they'll know exactly what it was about it. And for newer students, initially, that's one of the things that they'll, you know, they're, they're trying to learn is they just see the P&L and you know, one of my jobs is to explain to them and to make sure they understand all of the data around so that they just don't make a decision based on P&L. You can make bad trades, bad decisions and get lucky and make money, okay? Particularly in you know, the way these in, in a more volatile market, sometimes the volatility itself is just gonna, gonna help you out. So resulting, uh, I think there's a lot of traders out there who when they think about trading stats, they'll go away and say, oh, my winners look like this, my losers look like this, or this is, you know, this trade made me money, therefore it's a good trade. No, and I've seen that a ton of times with certain, you know, well-known trading coaches, you know, in social media. Oh, you know, my student today, you know, he was down 10 grand and he managed to, you know, managed to turn it around and he made 50 bucks. You know, uh, well done, you know, and I'm just sitting there going, oh, I'm not quite sure that's a good trade, but. You know, we all have different ideas, maybe in that style, that is a good trade, but I, you know, I would doubt that, right? But a lot of people just base the trade on, on P&L. And you really need to know more than that. And again, that to me, I'm always on the lookout for, you know, who's a real professional and, and who's not. And, you know, I can tell by the way they talk about trades. If people talk about trades with winning P&L equals good, trades with losing P&L always equals bad, that's a very amateur approach. Um, Exactly the same as I said in a, in a poker game, just because you lost money on a hand doesn't mean you did the wrong thing. It's not, that's not, life's not like that. Sometimes I've seen bad trades that make money. Um, so that's you know, something to, to understand. And I think that's one of the most common mistakes of people that do look at trade data is that they'll just look at it in terms of P&L. And as I said, you need to have a much deeper understanding of your trading method than just Look at PNL. It's one thing, you know, and of course, you know, over time, it, it, it's still, you st obviously, you still want to make money and you still want to look at what your good trades are doing, but understand that some positive PNL trades are not necessarily good. So the more depth that you can go into, the better. There's a you know, number of columns on the, the trade analyzer. The more depth you can go into on your trading, um, and, and, and a, you know, depth, I mean, just away from just, you know, the, the P&L, the more depth you understand your method and what it should look like, the better. Be open-minded about which data can help you. As I said, there's a lot of different columns, you know, and there's more, you know, there's, there's a whole ton of information that we can use when we're trading um, to look at. So be open-minded about what it is, what data it is that might help you to work out what's good and what's bad and what needs to be changed. 
be specific, you know, be one for being specific, you know, like exactly what happened here, exactly what might need to be adjusted. And build up a profile over time, particularly if you're not sure exactly what your data should look like. Okay, so build up over time, build up and, and keep looking at it and keep coming at it from different angles, slicing and dicing the data that you have to try and build up a really good profile of your method. And again, I'll come back to the start of this and say, you know, go to whoever teaches you and say, okay, what should the data look like? You know, go, you know, pick out six or seven or eight different columns that, that are in there and say, what should this column look like? What should this column look like? And anybody that has a style of training should know what each of those columns should look like. What it, what it means when it's good, what it means when it's bad. They can be different for different styles. Some, some people have different tolerances um, for certain risks than others. Um, but, be, but understand what it is for yours and, and, and go to whoever teaches you and, find, and ask them, what, what does this column, what should it look like? What's a good trader? What would it look like if I was good? What would it look like if I was bad or if there's a red flag? Try to understand the context behind the stats. By this, what I'm getting at is, um, you know, understand how your stats and your, you know, can change in different market conditions. You know, so as I said before, like during the day, there's, you know, there's the open is a lot busier than the mid morning and then the close is different again. So understand over time, again, build up this, a database, this knowledge base of your of your style, how it looks, um, and again, learn how it might change in different conditions. How would this particular column look on a high volatile day, on a low volatile day? Again, get build some baselines up so that when you you face with a change in market conditions, you understand how your method will look now, and therefore you should know what changes you need to make. That's, that's the whole point. You'll want to know what my method should look like so I know what changes I need to make. All this goes hand in hand. Um, and this is such huge information to you. Uh, Bruce and I again spoke before about, you know, people want indicators a lot and they do. Retail traders want indicators. But this information, the trades you have, the feedback you're getting is so crucial. It's so crucial that, you know, if you can use it and use it well, you, you will improve yourself, and that's the, that's the beauty of it. If you understand your style, you will be able to improve yourself as you're trading. Um, so this context as well will help you to refine your analysis. As you know, okay, it's a quiet day, this is what it should look like, it's a busy, it's a more volatile day, this is what it looks like, it's a lower liquidity day, this is what it looks like, etc., etc. Um, all of these things you should build up, and all of this you know, will help you to, with your trading. So it's a few slides coming up. We're going to talk about uh, amount of data. Uh, anybody that works in data knows, right? And I'm not a, a data expert, but anybody that works in this industry or data knows that the more data that you have, you know, generally the better, right? You, you can make larger samples uh, are, are more helpful to us than small samples. So this again points towards the benefits of higher frequency forms of trading. The more you trade, the more data you have. The more data you have, the more you can respond to that feedback, the more you can find this out quicker, right? If I'm trading once a day, okay, it's going to be much slower for me to build up all this information because I'm getting one piece of data a day, obviously. So the more data you have, the better judgments you can make, the quicker you can build a profile. So this gets to something that... Uh, it gets discussed a lot about trading, all right? So, uh, you know, as people talk about, or may, you may know, the Norton method has a target of quite a high win, win rate, which is actually quite typical of a more market-making style, generally. Um, but how often have you heard that, you know, uh, you know, this particular trader only has a win rate of 53% and, and that's fine, you can win. You hear that a lot around, right? You hear that a lot in retail social media, uh, FinTwit. Oh, yeah. So, you know, win rates are not important. You can, you know, you can make a lot of money with low win rates. Um, I'll bet that most of the times that you hear that about so-and-so's winning with, you know, making money with 52, 53% win rates, that trader's probably, um, uh, I say, 
it's a high profile, but uh, I, I think actually the word I was looking for, I think I made a, a, a typo in there, uh, is a high frequency trader. You know, most of the time that person's gonna be high frequency. There's a very big difference if you're high frequency on low frequency trading. Lowest percentage win rates can have a high number of losses and longer losing streaks, right? But they're easier to accept if you're trading a thousand, ten thousand, you know, a hundred thousand trades a day, because the losing streak could end in minutes. Um, so when you look at like the the high frequency firms, and some of them will have lower win rates, some of them will, in some styles, they are looking always to improve it. Everybody is, of course, we are. Everybody is looking to improve their style, but trading tens of thousands of times. You know, you may have a, you know, a whole series of losses, right? But that might be over in minutes. Whereas, if you trade just a few times a day, and this is where some of these things just don't relate to retail traders, okay? It's different if you're a high frequency. If you trade only a few times a day, not only is your data less fast because you don't have much of it, but your losing streaks can last for days or weeks. And I saw this a lot when I, when I was researching technical analysis for my original book, um, which is now, uh, now re-released it, Technical Analysis Exposed. I saw it because a lot of technical analysis indicators or, you know, or tools are not triggered a lot. So let's say, for example, one of the studies I saw was on the head and shoulders pattern. You know, you get lots of them, right? They're not triggered every week or every day, okay? They're, they're something to build over time in a contract. So I saw... Uh, a successful, you know, something that showed that the head and shoulders um, uh, pattern was successful over like about a 30 year period, I think it was. But there's not, a, there wasn't a lot of them. But this successful pattern had a 10 year period where it didn't make any money. Okay, because there's not lots of them, right? It's low frequency. Had 10 years. Now, my, my comeback to the, the author of the study was, I think most traders would have given up on it within 10 years if they'd have been losing money for 10 years, all right? So the idea that over 30 years it made, yeah, you had to have got through 10 years of not making anything with it. So I, I really doubt that, okay? And in fact, in subsequent, that, that um, author did a, a follow-up study on, on the head and shoulders pattern and found it to be, you know, basically 50-50 and, and, you know, it was a toss of a coin, which is what, you know, I would really expect from, from most of those sorts of patterns. But the key thing is that if, if you're not trading much and you're not getting, you know, so the, the, the head and shoulders pattern, another classic example, you're not going to give you many trades. You can have a run of, you know, if you have a low percentage win rate, 50 something percent, around 52, 53 percent, you can have a string of losses, a whole bunch of them. And if you only trade two or three times a day, you may have weeks, you know, before it turns around. And you make money. Well, by that stage, you may have used up your account. You may have, you know, drawn down your account substantially, and therefore not be in a in a in a place. Whereas, if you're a high frequency trader, that might that streak might be over in in, in a few minutes because you're trading thousands of times a day, or tens or hundreds of thousands of times a day. So I saw it a lot with successful, supposedly successful indicators that have relatively low uh, percentage win rates. They had like months and years of not making any money. I think that that's just, you know, you can't trade like that. You, you're just going to be knocked out of the business. So just understand that when you're looking at percentage win rates, um, if you have lower win rates um, and they are low frequency, you know, you are going to have some real struggles out there. You really are. So this idea of, oh, you can have a 53% win rate and make money, if it's, if it's a low frequency type of trading, which for many retail traders, they're, you know, technical ones in particular, they are, they're not going to be trading much once, twice a day. Just understand, you know, like anything with small amount of data, it's not that great for you. And you can have long periods of not making money. Um, so again, that's why I've said this before, most professional traders will try to find methods of trading with high frequency. There's so much power behind high frequency. I've explained some of that in the past. So again, try to understand what the stats really mean for you. So when someone says to you, oh, this method, you know, there's traders out there that make money with 53% win rates. Yes, they are. 
they probably higher frequency. So if you're not a high frequency trader, or you're not trading you know, 50, 100 times a day even, which is not high frequency by the HFT, but by general standards, it's higher than most. If you're trading once, two, three times a day, understand what that means to you, and understand what lower percentage win rates could mean to your style. So to start, sum up, um, and again, I'm really looking at this data from an intraday basis, okay? So how you respond to it, because that's where the power of this is. You're getting this feedback. So the first thing is you need to understand your method in enough depth that you know what the data should show. What should it look like? Um, otherwise, you're just throwing darts in the dark, basically, right? You're seeing this information, oh, well, I'll try and improve this, or I'll try and, but, but, but is, that what, is that what it should work with your method? And if you don't know it, then that's, a, you know, that's something to go back with, right? And say, okay, I now know I don't know my method in enough detail. That could be a eureka moment for some because in that sense, you now know you've got to go down and drill down some more, find out some more. And, and that's, you know, I would want to know everything about what's the weaknesses of what I'm doing, what's the strength of what I'm doing, how does it look in the good markets, how does it look when it's going badly. Marginal improvements you know, on an intraday basis is likely going to be the way to go. You know, there may be some moments of bigger steps, there may be some are uh, half type moments, but generally it's going to be small marginal increases uh, and, uh, you know, improvements that just continually just make small adjustments. Be very careful of resulting. So be very careful of just saying, trade that makes money is good trade, trade that loses money is bad trade. Okay, if that's all you do, um, you're going to make some mistakes along the way and you're going to get you know, there will be times you get whacked and you're just going to see, you won't, you won't see what's really happening. You're just seeing the PNL. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, there's, there's a whole ton of trades out there that, you know, some people would classify as poor trades that, that could make money. You could sell, you know, put options for one cent out there every day of the week. You know, I'd argue it's not potentially a good trade, but you know, your PNL could be positive for weeks, right? And it could be until it's not. Um, PNL is not really telling you what the, weaknesses and strengths of that trade are, even though you're picking up a cent every day. Um, understand that, you know, what are the weaknesses? What, what could show that there's a weakness here? So um, again, it needs you to understand in depth what you're doing. Um, and as I said, there's, there's lots of different data points, right, that we could look at. Be open-minded about all of them on, on that screen that we showed at the start and in, in your trade analyzer. There's a whole ton of different information in there. Be open-minded and understand what each one um, means for you. Um, anything where you're trying to use data um, to help your trading will be less use, less reliability if you have a low-frequency trading style. You're just not going to gather much information. It's going to take you a lot longer. It's going to take you a lot longer to figure out what your baselines are and what's good and what's bad. Um, and in my ability, that that uh, the use and response to data is another significant reason to use a higher frequency style of trading. Um, you're just getting so much feedback, constantly feedback that you know you should be able to improve. And I've since said this before. Um, when I think about my trading career and how it started, um, because of the, the type of trading, I was a market maker in the Japanese equity warrant market in 1990 when the Japanese market was crashing. Um, so one of the reasons why I, I put you know, my learning curve up there, how did I you know, be, improve? I'm trading two, 300 times a day in that market. So, I'm doing, you know, maybe a thousand trades a week. A thousand trades a week, fifty thousand trades a year in my first year of trading. And so think about how much feedback I got to respond to. Now imagine if I traded four times a day, you know, twenty times a week, maybe a hundred, you know, or less a month. Um, a thousand trades a year. It's a massive difference. Massive difference. Um, you know, I have years and years and years worth of experience over a, a, as a normal retail trader in my first year alone, just on the trades I did. So the amount of feedback I got was huge. The question then really becomes, can you respond to it? Right? Well, that's, you know, that's, then that's a personal thing. But that's a massive reason why 
I, I put, you know, my learning curve, I, obviously I was able to respond to that feedback as well. Um, but that ability to have, you know, hundreds of trades a day, I'm getting so much feedback that if I can respond to it, if I understand what's good and what's bad and I can respond to what I'm doing, then I've got a massive advantage over someone that's trading four, four times a day, five times a day. Um, and again, you know, it wasn't something I really thought about too much until I started to get more into the idea of frequency and, and looking at retail traders and thinking, how, how much experience are they getting? And it comes down to how we talk about that hours, right? Um, 10,000 hours, that kind of thing. Well, you know, I've said, I, you know, I would put trading more as 10,000 trades rather than 10,000 hours. If you spend 10 hours behind your screen and do two trades, you're not really getting enough feedback. You may be doing a lot of time behind the screen, but you're not getting enough feedback to improve. Whereas if I spend eight hours behind the screen and do 50 trades, I'm getting a ton more feedback. So feedback is really important. That's really the essence of this, um, this discussion. Feedback is really important. The more trades you do, the better, and use that feedback to improve. It's one of the most important pieces of information you're gonna keep getting. You know, people are always looking outside and for other things and, you know, what can help me? Look at your own stats. They're, they're a huge source, source of information. And if you have the ability to understand what you're doing and improve it, it's going to improve your trading dramatically. I'm happy to take some questions, uh, Bruce. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. Um questions at the moment i have a, a ton uh, actually for you gary uh so uh while we wait for for some other questions um uh so really really great stuff and it kind of overlaps with some of the other things that you'd talked about in previous webinars uh i put the link in there uh to uh gary's playlist on our youtube channel uh he talks about the oda loop and feedback loop uh, and this relates to uh, a lot of what you're uh, talking about here uh, a as well. Um, however, like, it, you know, there's kind of a chicken and egg uh, relationship here. I mean, you know, let's suppose that, I mean, one of the great ways to go is just get mentored by somebody and have them teach you a method. Uh, like your, your Norden method, go with that. Uh, and then you will learn what's right and what's wrong. Um, however, if you're starting off on your own, I mean, how, how do you do this? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. So if you're starting on your own, you, you, you're going to, obviously, you're going to want, first thing is you're going to try and choose a start of trading. Do you want to trade in the short term, like maybe hold trades for a few seconds, or do you want to try and swing trade and try and hold trades for half a day or for longer? That decision in itself is going to, you know, mean that your stats are going to look a bit different. Um, and then over time, as I said, it's always harder when you do it that way, right? I mean, um, I'm never saying I'm completely self-taught. I've had great mentors over the years as well, and then had to try to work things out. So that's unfortunate. If you do it on your own, you're going to need to work some of those things out. Um, and initially, you're probably going to make those mistakes of resulting. Initially, you're going to look at your winning trades and go, they must all be good. Right? And that, maybe that's a fair way of starting, but you know, there's obviously going to be dangers in that. And then gradually you're just by trial and error going to go, well, actually, I did that again and I lost huge, so that, that can't be it. What other data between this trade and this trade is different? And then you know, it's going to be a, you know, potentially a slower, longer process. Um, and again, if you're a low-frequency trader trading once or twice a day, this could take years. Um, so... Again, you know, to me, uh, and not just to me, I think to a lot of pros, you know, there's, there's so many benefits to, to looking for a higher frequency form of trading because if you respond to the feedback, you'll be, you're getting much more feedback much more quickly. Therefore, you should be able to develop quicker. Um, but it's, yeah, there's going to be a lot of trial and error if you, if you go about it yourself. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it sounds like, I mean, there's so many analogies here to, to make, but it, it, it sounds like, you know, you're just, it's the school of hard knocks. Like, you're going to make some really big errors uh, beginning, uh, and then just try to learn from them, uh, and then get back up on your feet and do better the next time. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
So be open minded though. Be open minded about the data, right? Just don't just close up and think, oh, just these two things are going to be important. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of data on your trade analyzer. Um, look across it and 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 really think. Because it also comes down to what what is my edge? You know, like I said before, Northern Method is very specific. Who the who are we trading against? Why are we trading against them? What our edge is? So it should become quite clear to us that certain data should react in certain ways. So. Again, if you if anybody looking to trade should be sitting there going, I think I have edge. Well, how? What is that edge? Who is it over? And then that will, should give you some idea of what it should look like on your trade analyzer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that will take some time too. I, I imagine to 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 make that connection. Um, uh, you know, and, uh, and and build. It just it just sounds like it. It will just have to be built up through experience and knowledge uh, over time. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And just pull on it everywhere. Pull on as much you know information from you know where you can see it. Um, as I said, just just drill down into it. You know, um, the, the, I mentioned the Formula One guys in here. You know, they'll they'll tell you that they could shave a fraction of a second off in so many different ways. It's not just, you know, put your foot a bit, bit further down on the metal, right? <laughs> There's a whole different bunch of ways, you know, whether it's the um, the drag on the car or I'm not an F1 guy, right? But there's a whole different bunch of ways they can set the car up to potentially. Um, and they'll look at the conditions as well, right? Context. Is it a hot day, cold day, rainy day? That's going to help them change. When they, they have an idea on a cold day, I need to change the settings in this way. It's like us as traders. On a volatile day, I need to change it in this way. And this is what it's going to look like on my screen. You know, it's, it's a kind of similar pro process, but it does require information. It does require some data and, and knowledge. You know, those engineers know that if, you know, if there's some drag in a certain way or whatever it is, they know what needs to be changed. You know, and that's our job as a trader. If you don't know how to change something, that I'm losing on volatile days in this way, if you don't know how to change it, and you don't know enough about your system um, and the style that you're using. So I think I made an analogy before in a webinar about when I was learning golf. And, you know, initially you go and learn golf. And I go to someone and I've got a problem, right? I'm hooking the ball or whatever. And he corrects the hook, right? And then before I know it, um, I might be slicing it, right? And I go back to him and he'll correct that. That's the wrong way of going about it, right? And eventually I figured out, I just went to a pro and said, just teach me about, I want to learn about the swing. And I want to learn about the mechanics of the swing so that I can correct myself on the, on the course. Otherwise, I'm not learning about a golf swing. All I'm learning is, you know, I'm correcting one mistake as I go. Um, and, you know, you need to know what does it look like and what is it what you need to correct it. Um, otherwise, as I said, my, my, your, my, my golf would never improve because every time I had a problem, I had to go back to it. So I had to learn the mechanics, everything in the more depth to, to become a slight, I'm not, I'm not saying I was a great golfer, but that, that's how I got my knowledge back and my handicap down. And I needed, to, for my own benefit as, a, as like a trader, I just came to the point, I need to know, I need to understand more than just correcting a mistake, one mistake. I need to understand what this thing is about. What is a golf stream? What does it look like? How does it feel? You know? Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of data that needs, that you need. So how do you, though, like, I mean, you know, I guess I, the discussion or I'm bringing up is, is uh, um, you know, not, not good in the sense that uh, there's all these analogies, though, like uh, uh, that maybe do not apply. For example, for your golf swing, uh, you know, let's say, suppose every time you hit a good, a good ball, uh, you know, a bird chirps. And you're, you make that connection like, oh, OK, well, you know, I'm looking to hear a bird chirp and then I'll, I'll hit the ball. It, you know, it's ludicrous, but like, you know, how do you know you're not going down the wrong path? That's why you need to know what's important behind your method, right? So when I'm learning to golf, I know that I never, never mentioned bird chirps as part of it. So when I learn, you know, I learn what was important. Um, but there's an old saying in golf, isn't there? That there's no pictures on a scorecard. So I, I could slice the ball off the tee, it hits a tree, you know, it slices off, you know, off to the right, it hits a tree, lands back on the fairway. Second shot, I do that again, it hits a tree and lands on the green, right? And I, and I putt, I get a birdie, right? And that's resulting, I go, yeah, I got a birdie, I'm playing well. But 
you know, there's no pictures on the scorecard, right? The scorecard says three, you know, on a par four, I've got a birdie. But, but I, you know, realistically, if I keep doing that, I, I'm not going to be hitting birdies, am I? I'm more likely to be going out of bounds. So I need to know that there's more about that. That, that wasn't a good hole. I didn't play that well. Um, so that's, that's what, you know, you have to start understanding that just because you made money on the trade doesn't mean it was good, but you need to understand, you know, that's why, you, that's really why you do go and, and, and have mentors. And we all did. I, I, everybody of my, you know, of my generation, you know, we all have trading mentors. I mean, um, uh, you learn in certain, you know, in different ways, but, um, you've got to have some understanding of what does this look like? What does it look like when it's right? And what does it look like when it's wrong? Otherwise, yeah, it's 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 a hard journey. Yeah, yeah, it it's it it, it yeah, it, it really does sound like uh, you you need some mentorship basically. To, to, you need to be pointed in the right direction um, uh, somehow. Uh, you know, like driverless cars. Uh, same idea is kind of this parent-child like uh, relationship for the machine learning. Like, no, don't do that. You know. Uh, and then another instance comes up and like, okay, you can do this, but you don't do that. And it's learning, but it's just going to take a long, long time. Um, yeah. I mean, there's very few professional golfers who didn't have lessons, hmm. you know, and you can watch it on television as much as you want, right? Golf, you can watch it as much as you want. There's very few, I don't think there's probably any professional golfers that never had lessons. There's probably, you know, and in, in, I, I coach soccer. There's no professional soccer players who didn't have coaching to teach them how to improve. If you go to any sports, American football, you, you name it, right? Every top athlete had coaching to get there. You know, you can't become a great heart surgeon without someone teaching you how to do it. You know, we are in one of the only businesses where people just, you know, think, yeah, I can just read a book and start trading and making money. That, that's, and, and it's not like that. We all had mentors coaches or whatever every one of us did you know there's very few uh, is, is, are there any i mean I'm, I'm asking this question out there now are there any professions or anything that you can do that's difficult and trading is definitely difficult where there's people that reach the top with no no coaching i don't know maybe there is but i think we all love it to be that way i'd love it if i didn't need a golf you know and, and to be fair to begin with my mate was teaching me golf when I was 15 or 16. Because my mate was teaching me that at the driving range. But he can't get me so far. You know, I got to be a hit the ball in the air a bit, fair enough. But then it, you know, it fell apart pretty quickly. Because <laughs> I didn't have the mechanics. So I figured, you know, I didn't know anything. So yeah, I, could, I got to a point, yeah, I started to hit the ball in the air a bit. I think I can go to the golf course. And I was probably playing off like 25, 26. I think I'm getting there. And then suddenly I'm falling apart. But I actually know nothing about what I've my about golf, my swing, nothing about it at all. I just continually, like you said, continually try and error at the golf driving range, try and error, try and error, and eventually if something seems to work, that's great, it gets me out there, it lasts for a few weeks or a couple of months or whatever it might be. If you're lucky, you might get six months with it. I can't remember how long I got with that on a golf course before it just fell apart. So because I had, it, was, it was never sustainable. It was never sustainable, that's just the reality. So then, I mean, if you're stuck in that loop with your trading, uh, you know, trial and error, trial and error, trying to draw conclusions. You're, tr you're analyzing your trades. Uh, you're trying to draw conclusions, but it, it, it's just like being at that range uh, and just, you know, you're going to, you're going to be there for, for years and, and slightly improve your, your swing. Which I think is where a lot of retail traders are at. Exactly. Right? They, don't really know, they don't know how to adapt their trading, which is why I started this by saying, you need an in-depth knowledge of what you're trying to do. What are you trying to do? What will it look like? And if you don't, I think that's, that's where most retail traders come at it. We all know there's a high failure rate of retail traders. They come at it from the perspective of like me on the golf course, just keep trial and error, trial and error, right? Then every, you know, but we never, you know, I never really had an idea of what is it? Why did I do that? I don't know, it just worked. It just worked for a bit when I, you know, move my shoulder this way or put my stance up. I just, it, yes, I hit it a couple of times. So I'll just keep doing that. But it, it was not what was right, but it worked for a while. Um, I think that's how most retail traders are, frankly, and why, why there's a struggle out there. Needed to know, there needed to be some method to what I'm doing. 
No, I'm doing this because this will induce this. This will lead to this. Um, I think that's missing from a lot of, a lot of retail traders. Um, and that's why I started this off with, you need to know what your method looks like. You need an in-depth understanding. And, and again, another thing I talk about retail traders, is what is your edge? What is specifically, I think I did that in one of the webinars, what specifically are you trying to make money off of here? What specifically are you making money out of? And if you can't answer that question, then you're probably not going to survive. You know, you're, you're, you are just hoping. Um, there needs to be something quite specific about what you're doing, what you're picking off and why you're picking off and when you're going to pick that off. Um, once you have, once you start to understand that, those questions, then we can start and then the data becomes more important. Otherwise, yeah, you are just throwing darts in the dark. Yeah, yeah. But I always approach it from the perspective of, you know, people that really want to make money as a trader will come about this from the right way. We'll, we'll learn it, you know, we'll understand the method that they're doing. We'll, we'll you know, um, build up a, a good understanding of what they're trying to do, how it will look. Um, whoever they learn from will be able to teach them that. And then the data is the tool we use to make sure that we're getting there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it literally, I mean, it begs the question here uh, uh, about um, you need to know what you are looking for. Uh, is yeah. that this is the crucial step right there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 100%. yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can get started in the right direction there, then this will much be much easier to, for these other steps to fall into into place. Um, I just want to uh, uh, so I yeah I've got your your key points uh, slide up here, but I also want to show people this um, uh, this tool that. Um, uh, developed here. It's actually called the Trading Statistics uh, in Bookmap. Uh, if you guys are interested in this, you can you can read through it. I put the link into the chat. Uh, it's on our Bookmap knowledge base in the add-on section here, and then you can see it here, Trading Statistics. Uh, all of the um, uh, you know data points uh, are, are listed here. Uh, so you can read through it like, you know, uh, MEA, MFA, like, you know, pre and post, etc. Uh, and uh, you know this is uh, we're it's a great uh, uh, first rendition here, uh, and we will continue to uh, uh, develop this this tool for you. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to cover that. So if anyone had any questions on that, uh, and then uh, Gary, I want to get to some other questions here uh, from some of the uh, YouTubers. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, old pork chops is saying. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Gary, about uh, Australia losing to England uh, in the World Cup. I got, I got both, I got both horses in that race. I said that before, but I am <laughs> because I'm in Australia. I, I am supporting. I was supporting the Matildas, uh, but I'm English originally, so uh, well, I'll be supporting England in the final. So, so what? What? Um, he, he's asking uh, what trading stats uh, uh, should I be looking to improve. Yeah, so, I mean, if you want to bring up the, your list, actually, um, sure. yeah, Bruce, let's, let's go and have a look at that again. Um, this is, you know, really interesting. So there's a ton of information here. This, this, and this is what I meant. There's, what, 20. There must be 20 different items there, right? Yeah. Um, be open to any of them. There's some of those that we use in an order method that I think people will be like, Really? That's an important stat, and it is for the Norton method, for example. And there'll be things out there that you, you know, people will be really baffled by, it, but they can still be very important. And there will be questions I ask my students if they're having a bad day. Oh, there'll be certain questions: Did you do this? Did you, how many of these type of trades did you have? And it, the answer will almost certainly be not enough of certain certain style, for example. Everybody will know like MAE, MFE, right? Um, they're still interesting to know. You know that, that's two that I'll pick off to start with. Uh, again, they'll be different depending on your style. If you're holding trades for half an hour, you know your MAEs are going to be different from, let's say, uh, ours, where we're holding trades for a second or two. But still, the relationship between them is still going to be important. Like I said, you know, don't be results-based. If you've made four ticks on a trade, and it went 30 against you, PL is not really important there, is it? It's probably not a good trade. 
okay, something, some, something's happened there, and you don't want to do that again. You don't want to keep running into that because eventually it's not going to come back four ticks, is it? And, and it's just going to end up down 30. So, um, again, the, the actual numbers themselves will change depending on what style. Um, but any of these things here, any of those things on that list, really, um, could be important to your, your style. Just, again, I'd say if, you, if you're completely starting on your own from scratch, it's going to take time to build that database up of, you know, and, and then there'll be, you know, and, and of course, one way to go through is look at your trades that have very low MAE that you do quite well on. That might be the way you start. Right, and think, okay, it's reasonable to assume this might be a decent trade. And then have a look at some of the other metrics in that trade and perhaps start with that as a baseline. Perhaps, right? That's something. If you have no understanding at all, you, you know, you, you either taught yourself or the person that taught you doesn't know, um, that might be something. But any of these, you know, could be something that helps you. Um, and as I say, particularly. I think always, if you're high frequency, short term, uh, it's it's more it's easier to, to know and, and, and there's more data. But um, yeah, there's so many things here, Bruce, that, that you know that could be interesting. So many could be interesting. Don't rule anything out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, can you give us a scenario like uh, I, you know, the next step? Let, let let's suppose that someone's looking at uh, MEA, MFE, and then. Uh, uh, what would be the next step, like, you know, time time involved in the trade, number of ticks, or making some sort of kind of uh, comparison or, or relation? Um, I, you know, yeah. just... Yeah, again, time involved in the trade uh, can be a really interesting metric, but again, it will change depending on what style you're using of what, what good and bad is. Um, but in general, in general... I, you know, I would say, um, and this particularly for the Norton method, the shorter time you're in a trade, the better. You know, you only want to be in a trade. You know, it's one of the reasons why the Norton method, where, you know, I want to start a trade, and I'm in and out in two seconds. The quicker I'm out of a trade, the less chance there is that something, you know, something can smash me, right? That's a key, key, key point behind why I want to trade that way when I trade for myself. Okay, so I would always approach day trading from the perspective of the the shorter time I can be in this trade and take money, the better. Okay, um, I, I approach it from the perspective of the longer that I'm in this trade, the more chance there is of something hurting me. Now, maybe that's just because I'm just a, a, an old trader that's just seen too many bad, bad things for people, right? But other people say, I don't even want to wear it as long as you can. Um, there may be some styles where that is, that the longer you hold the trade, the better, all right? It's not the way for the Norton man. It's just not, right? But there might be a way that you want to hold it for longer. But of course, the longer you hold trades, you may have bigger M MAEs or, you know, you're going to have those swings as it's moving around, you know, whether you want that, whether you can hold that is another matter. Um, but for the Norton method, for example, the shorter the better. Yeah. Now, that, that's always that way. That, that's, that, that's, so that's, that'll be one key thing that we look for. Um, and, you know, when we're going through comparing stats, there's certain, you know, certain t time stats that we all look at in a certain way. Um, but as I said, like, the, you know, if it's, if some even off this screen, but there's, there's a whole ton of information here. It's, it's so valuable. And, you know, if anything, it, I hope that I've just will trigger people to think about what they're doing in a bit more depth, and, you know, and a bit more, um, to be that bit more specific about, okay, yeah, what exactly will this look like? Because that might trigger something and they go, oh yeah, my method should do this. And then from there, you'll get to improve your method and you'll learn more from it. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the game we're in. That's what we're trying to do. Learn more about what we do. You know, I know there's certain things where I'm going to lose, certain situations where, you know, the weaknesses of my trades. I know that. I want to try and avoid that as much as possible. But I, I said, as I said during the thing, I want to know why something happened. Why did I lose? Can I improve that? Can I change that? Otherwise, you know, I, I just, I just don't think that. Um, I, I think I, I personally would, would hate trading if I had no idea why, why I lost on the trade, or just go and do it again. Oh, I, I'd hate that. You know, uh, I, I, that would be like, how am I going to improve here? I'm not saying I'm going to hit 100, percent but I can certainly aim. 
to try and, you know, hit as best, the highest I can. Of course I can. The only way I can do that is by constantly reevaluating and constantly trying to improve. Yeah. Well, how much time, so, you, you know, I, I really like what you said, uh, kind of the end of your presentation to, of like, kind of look at yourself in the mirror type of, uh, you know, turn around, don't look outside and go, well, what about a new indicator or whatever it might be, but look at yourself, look at your trading, understand what your actions were, how to improve. Now, how much time should you or would you recommend, you know, spending on that? Like uh, some sort of ratio. Let's suppose you, you trade the, the open for a couple hours every day or something. Uh, how much time would you uh, look at your trading uh, and uh, analyze it uh, afterwards? Constantly. So you are, my students are constantly, and I, you know, I, I'm at the point that my, my some of my students have been doing this now for you know a year, two years, or whatever. I've just you know recently been posting some from one of my students, and you know he narrates as he's going along, which is great because I used to narrate the videos right and tell people what's right. He, he's he's very good at it now, and he narrates it. And I just put up his narrations now on on our channel, <laughs> and every trade, every trade he's narrating, like you know our trades are in and out in a few seconds so that decision's made really quickly but the checklist that i give my students is one that they can you know even though there might be six or seven things on that checklist you can do that once you've done it like hundreds of times like anything you'll go through that checklist very quickly right it's a bit like when you when you want to pull out in your car right when you're first doing that it's like mirror 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 you know signal maneuver blah 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 you know there's eight or nine things that you do when you're pulling out to enter a road for example but once you've done it a hundred times you know that's done in a fraction of a second all those things similar so you know you know as he talks as is what we all should be doing all of my students is every trade go through it okay that wasn't good i didn't like that about it and change and that's that's constant so it's, it's constantly happening because you're constantly getting feedback whatever it is they're not all going to be perfect shots but they're trying to achieve that and they just keep getting feedback you know every day is a little bit different some days they're you know, thinning a little bit. Some days they might be catching a little bit, catching a little bit fat, or whatever it might be, um, and they're just making those adjustments. Same for us. We, we're trying to do the best we can, and every time we're doing something, every time we have a trade, we, we're up, updating it. And then at the end of the day, that's a different matter. And I didn't really talk much about end of day. I didn't talk at all really about end of day analysis here. But that's a different sort of scenario where you look at your stats for the whole day, um, where you're looking at it, sort of, I suppose, in a sort of more holistic way of okay let's have a look at this whole day how many trades did i do you'll look at certain information there which is different like how many trades did i do for example is not important when you're um necessarily when you're just doing trade by trade intraday trading but at the end of the day you're going to look at the, some of that different information as well how many trades did i do did i over trade today um and and other things or did i not trade enough did i not do enough of these types of trades or in that type of trade at the end of the day you'll do more of that kind of analysis um, like I say, if you look at the you know, top level pros, you know, whether it's in golf, whether it's the Mercedes Formula One team, every bit of feedback they get, they will respond to. Every bit of feedback they get, they will respond to. And you know, I think that's one of the key things I want people to take out of this is every trade you do is feedback. Every trade, you do, it's a wonderful opportunity. It's an amazing opportunity. Every trade you do is feedback. Can you respond to it? That's, that's the question I'm going to ask people. That's the, the challenge. Can you respond to it? Because if you can, that's how you can improve. Uh, let's, uh, let me get to a few more questions, Gary, and then uh, we, can, uh, we can wrap it up here, I think. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, someone's asking about uh, uh, your uh, track record or trade performance. Uh, and... Um, uh, I don't know exactly what that means in maybe in terms of probabilities uh, or, um, I don't know, uh, uh, just uh, if there's, if you have any sort of response to that. Um, I mean, what I'll say is that I, I trade in different styles, right? So day trading is one thing um, with the fund as options. And that's, so that comes back into that point, right? Uh, with the, with my hedge fund, uh, we design op in uh, mostly op well, certainly the ones that I, I work on designing are many option trades. My partner designs some other types of trades uh, as well. Now, 
Again, with those trades, it's a completely different thing again. Those trades are held for generally a few days. Um, so my uh, win rates and what's good and bad and the, the data that comes out of those stats is completely different to the data that we'll get from the normal method as a trader, right? And, but I have to know that and respond to that as well. Um, and again, you know, I'll set um, different parameters. And again, like when we, we design the trades, if I don't know what's going on here, uh, it's not a trade that I'm going to really want. You know, my question is, how can I improve this trade? And where can I get it to where I know that if it goes wrong, I know what the weakness is. I know that that's, that's what happened there. Um, so, you know, I know that for different styles of trading that even I do, I'll have different, different data that's going to help me or not help me. Uh, right. And that's one of those things. I'm, I'm not perfect. Of course, I'm not perfect. I'm just like everybody else. I have good days, average days, bad days, right? And like everybody else, we, we all fight that battle. And no one's, uh, none of us are any different in that way. Uh, I've never held myself up and said, oh, I'm like the world's greatest trader, anything like that. Um, you know, I, I think, and I've been told by students, I'm, I'm a decent teacher of trading as well as being a, you know, a reasonable trader. I've met lots of traders who are better than me. You know, in, in many different aspects and different ways. And sometimes they're traders that will take more risk than me. I'm a very conservative trader. Um, always have been. Um, so, but, you know, uh, it's, yeah, we have, you know, I, I, like everybody else, we, you know, every, every day, every week, every month, you know, we make mistakes and you just try to, you know, am I able to learn from my mistakes? That's, that's always a key aspect for me. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> It sounds like for just about anything, it's a key aspect uh, uh, and self-reflection and, and, and improvement and uh, uh, down to minutia, uh, like you're saying about uh, Formula One teams or golfers or, you know, specific athletes <laughs> at performing at a very, very high level um, and uh, being, being able to uh, uh, basically get to an unconscious uh uh consciousness of I, I know that's a term in in some of the trading books etc but you, you know exactly what you're doing exactly what you're looking for uh and you can do it in real time like uh yeah. the one trader that you had mentioned uh uh narrating in in real time yeah yeah and and i, I that to me like when i get to that point where i'm seeing my students now able to do that i'm like okay I, you know the guy's got it right it's not and it it's like anything it becomes a skill then rather than you know because he's doing it all lifetime you know every couple of seconds making those things and he's not the only one other other students are doing that too but, but i just i just posted one last week that's why it was just sitting in my head um and this trade is you know particularly good at it um but yeah i mean as i said find find a something out there where the best people at it, the people that are very good or professionals, are not looking at their work in that detail. You know, do you want a surgeon that's not going over what he just did in the surgery today, you know, and going over it in detail to make sure that he's learned from, you know, anything can improve. You know, we, we want everybody we deal with in life to be improving. Every sportsman you see is working on that in that way. Why, why should trading be different? You know, and that's what sometimes I feel like some people just feel like, oh yeah, trading, I'll just be able to do this and that and I'll make money and I'll just, you know, I'll set up this breakout of a pattern or whatever and I'll just buy it here and the stock below and that's it and I'll make money. It's, it, come on, and that's just like saying, <laughs> I'll just swing a golf club and I'll hit the board. It's just not what pros do. That's not in any walk of life. Yeah, 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 understood. Um, so um, I think... Let's see if there's any more questions here. No, I think we, we're we're uh, we're finished, Gary. Uh, is there anything uh, you would like to any kind of uh, parting wisdom you'd like to leave us with? Uh, nothing different than what I've said. Just if you're not using the um, analyzer tool, you know, use it, look at it, and um, and, and don't cut um, columns out of it. Any of them could be important. Any of them could be interesting. Um, and, and view this as a, as a massive opportunity. You know, view that data as a massive opportunity. Um, the feedback that you're getting is just, it's so valuable. Um, so, you know, we all know that you know, a lot of retail traders are not, so are not using this data. Um, so have a look at it, build it up. Um, and yeah, use this as, learn about what you're doing. 
Um, and I say, if this for some people may trigger them to go away and think, okay, I need to contact who I learned from or that, you know, more people that are more in, knowledgeable about the style that I'm doing and try to ask people, okay, what does it look like? And again, I think, again, any, anybody worth their salt in this industry will be able to tell you that. Um, that the style they're using, this is what it looks like. That all itself is maybe a question you didn't ask when you, when you learned that style. Okay, now ask that question. What does it look like in data? Not just the, the you, know, you know, min rates, but what does it look like in other data? And that will help you a little bit further. And you might just get a little bit of a more knowledge about the style that you're using. It, so it might push the next stage as well, which will help you then improve your training in a different way. Excellent. Thank you very much, Gary. My pleasure, Bruce. Thanks for inviting me on again. Okay. All right. Take care. See ya. Bye-bye.